Thank you very much, and thank you to all our witnesses for uh, being here today. Uh, some great uh, testimony. Certainly one of the things that I'm hearing is that one of our problems is that um, when it comes to the housing space, we have a government that really only um, measures value in the housing space uh, still through profit. And so a lot of the a lot of the programs that we're seeing are really always ask the question, mm -hmm. how do people who invest in housing make profit? And if the answer is that they don't, then there's very little investment. And if there's a mechanism that somehow includes profit, as it did in the RCFI as an example, then, uh, then government seems to appreciate the value of the program more than when there isn't profit. But when we talk about productivity and we talk about access to housing for workers and all of the more indirect and perhaps harder to measure, although I think actually a lot of folks have shown that it's pretty easy to measure if you have the conceptual tools that you're at your at your disposal. So one of the things we've talked a little bit about here today is a nonprofit acquisition fund to ensure that community organizations who are competent housing deliverers have the access to capital that they need to compete with the corporate landlords that otherwise are coming in and scooping up those buildings. That's something that New Democrats have supported for a long time. We're very happy to see the PC NDP move ahead on that in their own way. Um, I, one of the questions that comes up in the context of a nonprofit acquisition fund is how to make sure that it doesn't simply become a tool for divestment by REITs and corporate landlords who have bought up some of these buildings, done what they're going to do in terms of um, evicting tenants and jacking up rents, and now see more value in selling the building than continuing to operate it. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, Ms. Houle and Mr. Sullivan, if you might have some thoughts on what kind of guardrails can be put in place to ensure that a nonprofit acquisition fund um, delivers benefit to uh, Canadians and to people who need access to affordable housing and doesn't simply become a way, uh, 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 a divestment tool for uh, larger landlords. Maybe we could start with Mr. Sullivan and then uh, come to Ms. Hull. Thank you for the question, MP Blakey. What we need to focus on is interrupting that cycle that you described where especially, you know, large financialized landlords are, are purchasing properties, often displacing the tenants who are there so that they can raise the rent, thereby raising the value of the asset, and then selling that asset and returning the profit to their, to their shareholders and members. Moving that, uh, that, that, that building into nonprofit and co-op control interrupts that, that cycle. Um, that's why we're focusing on acquisition. It, it protects those tendencies because we know in that transaction in the private sector, those tendencies are at risk. There's a strong motivation from a new owner to increase the value of their assets by displacing those tenants and changing those, those rents. And the longer someone has been in that home, the more they're a problem on the balance sheet for that, for that new owner. So, you know, grandma who's been living there at 20 years at an $800 a month rent is vulnerable in this situation. And no longer will be when that property is owned by a nonprofit or co-op or or a community land trust. Um, that's that's the outcome that that we need to to protect. Ms. Holden, do you have anything to to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, the committee's already heard from Maureen Fair, who is the executive director of West Neighborhood um, House, and on the need for maybe uh, considering tax forgiveness for private firms that sell their business. Their, their buildings to nonprofit and public entities. And also, according to Jill Black, who's a housing researcher, you know, owners of rental buildings should be allowed to maybe uh, defer taxes on capital gains and CAA recapture if they sell to nonprofit or buy another building within a year. So there are ideas that are put forth in order to do this and do this, as you say, to do it well. Simon, was you have something to add? Yes, I think the law is... I think that uh, the law is important and the action of the government is important, but uh, in Quebec uh, there are cooperatives uh, and uh, there is a requirement uh, that when there is a sale of a, uh, this kind of a building, uh, uh, the, the minister can intervene uh, to uh, ensure that uh, the investment uh, uh, by a fund must be into a public good. And uh, when we invest in uh, housing, 
uh, in Quebec um, uh, when it's a cooperative uh, under the law on the cooperatives uh, there is not uh, uh, it is not allowed to uh, sell their building to a private uh, investor uh, without consulting the ministry at least and uh, so i think this kind of measure uh, ensures that uh, uh, social housing will continue to exist uh, and uh, and that uh, means that there's guaranteed affordability and the only thing uh, that we have uh, that we have to do in canada to ensure uh, affordability this is the kind of thing we do and uh, i think that uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, ensure uh, that uh, there are safeguards because the, the private sector will always want to uh, 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 buy up, uh, and this is something that is important for affordability. Ask uh, on the topic of guardrails. You talked a little bit about use of uh, federal land. You had mentioned that there's been an announcement about ensuring 20 20 percent of units built on federal land are affordable. The Democrats would agree that that threshold should be higher. But I wonder if there are other guardrails that you think the federal government should be looking at putting in place around the use of federal land for housing to ensure that Canadians get the maximum value in terms of addressing the housing crisis out of the use of that land as opposed to developers maximizing value through profit. Thank you for the question. I, I think all public land, federal, municipal, and provincial, uh, should be set aside for community housing development um, in, in any residential context. Uh, you know, this can be a mixed income community, which allows a nonprofit developer to leverage the value of market rents to provide even deeper affordability to a portion of the neighbors that there. Uh, to me, dedicating 20% is, is nibbling at the edges. We need to change the mandate of Canada Land's company completely so that it's not driven toward a return on investment or a return on the value of the land from property, but the social return of creating more affordable community housing. So we, we've heard today that spending on housing is not inflationary. And incidentally, we haven't heard these things for the first time today. We've heard that spending on housing is not inflationary. We've heard that there are ways the government can actually leverage public land, not only to build housing, but to improve its financial position on the ledger through leasing, as an example. Um, we know that uh, new housing projects can leverage market rent in order to make deep affordability possible for other units. It sounds to me, and I'm curious to get a quick uh, survey of our witnesses today, the issue is, is for as much as addressing the housing crisis costs money, and I'm not trying to gloss over that, but it sounds to me like the financial resources do exist to address the problem. Is it a problem principally of access to finance or is it a problem of political will? Uh, and getting, you know, long-term funding commitments out of the federal government and, and getting governments on the same page to get the administrative ducks in a row to be able to mobilize a sector that is clearly ready to deliver on the housing that uh, Canadians need. Maybe we'll start with Ms. Houle and um, just take a quick answer from each of our witnesses. Well, I, as you said it, the sector, the non-market housing sector, co-ops and non-profits, they are ready. They, they know what to do. There is the business acumen that act uh, that exists. We do need the political will, but we need the alignment of all levels of government to make it happen as well. But we also need an all of government approach. Like I said, this is not just a housing issue. It is a housing and health, mental health um, issue as well, and around uh, protections of people. Thank you. Mr. Simo? If we don't do all, you, all that you said before, soon, in a big scale, we won't have a housing crisis, we'll have a social crisis. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that we wake up as a, as a whole, as a, as a country, to do what we need to avoid that. And we have all the tools. We just need to have the will and the money and uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Yes, and the commitments that were made under the National Housing Strategy expire in 2028 or before, and we are within sight of that cliff and can see those things dropping off. Four years is a very short period of time when it comes to developing affordable housing, and we need to ensure that that legacy continues or we will be in the social crisis that Simo describes. 